we are going to see what happens if you are drawing two dependent samples. Then what will happen to the sampling distribution of the difference of the sample means. Now, see in real life, we may not always come across independent samples, right? Because the samples on the observations that you draw are more or less likely to be dependent on each other. For instance, if you consider the output of a machine and you note down what is the output of the machine before a maintenance is done and after that maintenance is done, what will be the output? If you compare them, so these are basically dependent samples. Or you can consider in marketing research, suppose they launch an advertising campaign and they want to compare the sales before the launch of that advertising campaign and after that. Likewise, so these are certain situations in which you come across these dependent samples. So we want to see now how the sampling distribution would vary. So, so far we have focused on independent samples. So, so now we will focus on the dependent sample. So the first result in this criteria is when the standard deviation is known to us. Okay, so in this case, what happens is that sigma d, which is the population standard deviation, is known. And what is this d suffix? Let us try to see. What it says over here is if you have xi's and yi's, these are normally distributed, and xi's and yi are are dependent. Okay, then so you have xi's, you have yi's, then you can calculate di's. Di's will be basically your xi minus yi. So the difference between these two, if suppose it is the cholesterol level, you want to see what is the impact of the new drug that has been introduced. So uh, suppose it is for checking the cholesterol level. So in that case, before the new drug is introduced and after that, you can measure the cholesterol levels. So suppose this is before the drug is administered and excised and yi's are after the drug is administered. So in such cases, they are dependent. Now we will observe, we will note down what is the difference in these values. Once you get these values, you can obtain the mean of this d bar. So d bar would be nothing but summation di in normal formula divided by the total number of observations, right? If mu d is mean is this, this is the mean that is given to us and sigma d basically this is the population standard deviation of the pairwise difference. So this is for the population one and it is known to us. Then in this case, we can see that, so this statistic over here is going to follow your normal 0, 1. So let us see why this is happening. Since your x i and y i is a normal distributed, okay, this this linear combination again would also be a normal kind of distribution. So these basically d i s are now independent normal random variables with mean equality and standard deviation is one. Because initially you had a dependent sample x i y i. Now by taking the corresponding differences, you have moved and transformed the dependent sample into a single independent sample or single sample basically. And we have seen earlier in the last week also that if you draw a single sample from a population where the standard deviation is known to us, in that case we have seen that if you can recall the sample mean follows normal in the mu and various sigma squared by n. And if we started in it becomes sigma minus v, sigma y n follows normal. Zero one. Now, what is happening is that instead of mu, you have d over here. Instead of sigma, you have sigma of x d. So we are using this d notation to denote that basically that we are talking about the differences of this. Okay, this d is. And instead of x r, you have over here this is d. Okay. So now, which is the same logic? Now you have here, the eyes of a single sample that is coming from normal population, V is given, variance is given. So you can simply use this result which we have already obtained that x bar minus V, sigma by root n follows 1, 
So whenever sigma is unknown, p distribution comes into picture, and you replace the sigma unknown by the corresponding standard deviation. Same thing as we have done last week. Here also, it is saying that if it is unknown, so you have x i's, you have y i's, you know you can calculate with the corresponding differences, pairwise difference. Okay, n would be there. Now you can calculate. U b is given to you, but this is not given to you, right? So that is why so sigma d is unknown. So you estimate it using the sample standard deviation, and the moment we replace sigma d by sta sample standard deviation, this one, then the distribution becomes t with n minus one degrees of freedom. Okay, so it comes from there straight in a straightforward manner. And here also you can see that the proof also is very simple. It is on the same lines as we have done just now, so I am just showing it to you over here. So, as we have seen, x i and y i is a normal random variables. So, d i, which is the difference between these two, is also a normal random variable. Now, again, these are your independent normal random variables. Mean is the population mean, and here you have the sample standard deviation. So, we know that t, basically, which is your X, instead of so originally what it is x bar minus mu s by root n it will follow t distribution with n minus 1 degree of freedom so instead of x bar you would have d bar minus instead of mu you would have mu d s will be replaced by s d divided by root n this would be following t distribution with n minus 1 degree of freedom and this is what your result set okay so now let us see an example to understand that. Suppose here you, what you are given is you have a group of 10 male participants in a dietary intervention and the plan was designed based on, to assess its impact on their weight and the weights are given. So before diet and after diet weights are given to you. Right? And it is on the same set of 10 individuals. Okay? So they are dependent. Okay? So these are excise. So this is basically your x i, x1, x2, x10, and this is your y i. So if you have to deal with this, this by looking at the data, you can immediately identify that this is a dependent data set. So you would no longer be working and using the original result that we had. That if you have a two sample problem, then how to just use the first a a result that we had, right? That sigma one square and is two. Well, you can find out. But in this case, what happens is that First of all, you would note down what are the corresponding differences, di's. You can rather denote it by capital di also, so there it is no issue. You will note down the corresponding differences. Then you would note down, you will find out its sample mean and the corresponding standard deviation. And suppose if it is given that mu d is 0, then you can calculate the t statistic as this. Note that here I am just finding out the statistic. I am not using it for hypothesis testing because those will be covered in the later sec later weeks of this course. As of now, we have learned about only the sampling distribution. So our focus in all these problems is to reach to a point where the statistic can be found. Out. We know the distribution of that. We know the sampling distribution of each of these in different situations, and that is the objective of this week. Okay. From next week, we will see how to do estimation and other stuff. So here we are dealing with SD. So basically, you can see that here we are using. So here I said. So instead, A if it is known, if the sigma is known to you, 
otherwise you would use the other one which is unknown right or the full standard deviation or now we have seen about the difference of the sample means and now we are going to talk about the ratio of sample variances if you recall whenever we are finding out the distribution of the variances we learn the result that n minus 1 times s square by sigma square follows chi square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom so it means when we are talking about the ratio of the sample variance then also chi square distribution would come into picture right and that is why we have another distribution which is known as f distribution so let us see what is it the f distribution says that if you have x and y following chi square random variables so let us see if x follows chi square distribution with m degrees of freedom and y is another chi square distribution with n degrees of freedom then if you have in the numerator x divided by its corresponding degrees of freedom and y divided by its corresponding degree of freedom then it will no longer follow your chi square distribution rather this would follow f distribution with parameters or you can see the degrees of freedom m and n so first degree of freedom is coming from this side and the second degree of freedom is coming from the denominator okay so this also since it is based upon your chi square distribution so it also takes value from 0 to infinity so it's something like this and unlike t or z which are more symmetrical okay so normal standard normal and these these are more symmetrical but rather chi square or f these are in this form okay so this is about your f distribution so we will make use of this f distribution in finding this next result the theorem says that when random samples of size n1 and n2 are independently drawn from two normally distributed populations such that their variances are same this ratio over here it will follow f distribution it will follow f distribution with n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1 degrees of freedom right so by the definition if you see it means that this n1 minus 1 degrees of freedom is coming from the numerator and this one is coming from the denominator term right so here we can get an f distribution if we rearrange the terms in such a way that a numerator also has a chi square random variable with n1 minus degrees of freedom and denominator would also be chi square if it is with n2 minus 1 then only this quantity is going to follow f distribution with these degrees of freedom right so let us just focus on this f that is given to us so to prove this here you can see that we have we are just taking this as one square over s2 square since we want to make it as a chi square and we know that n1 minus 1 s square by sigma square will be chi square so basically we try we try to incorporate these n1 minus 1 sigma square for the first one right so we have written in this way we have multiplied and divided it again for the second one we need n2 minus 1 n sigma square so we have multiplied and divided it over here and this term we can see that these all will cancel out so it will not affect the original term that we had okay now by just rearranging the terms you can see that here in this one if you see the numerator how we are getting this so we have just rearranged the terms to so n1 one minus 1 one times s1 square divided by sigma square and this term will come likewise here you have this now if u is following basically your chi square with n1 minus 1 degrees of freedom and v is following chi square with n2 minus 1 degrees of freedom then basically you have this and this distribution you can see that it will be following f distribution with n1 minus 1 degrees of freedom and n2 minus 1 degrees of freedom okay so the proofs are simple the, you have to keep the basic idea in mind that how do you obtain such distributions right if you know that it is going to be related to chi square so for that you need to also have the knowledge about this one right what happens in the original 
population when we have a single sample. Okay, so that is why we basically learn about a single sample problem and a two sample problem because if you are dealing with these two, you can easily generalize them over more number of samples. Okay, and then there is no difficulty in understanding them because it is a simple generalization and extension of the original format. So everywhere like this, you will be using the original concepts that you have studied in these two weeks. Okay. So for this, let us consider this example over here. Suppose you want to compare the variance of two different brands of tennis ball. So brand A and brand B is there. You select 10 tennis balls from brand A and 12 from B. And their sample variances are given to you as S1 square and S2 square. Okay. Now in this case, let us see how you can calculate your F statistic. So here it is easy to see. Suppose S1 square and S2 square is already given to you. N1 is 10 and N2 is 12. Right. So we know that S1 square over S2 square, this is your F statistic. It follows F distribution with N1 minus 1 degrees and N2 minus 1. Right. So S1 square over S2 square, this would be some value. Suppose this is F1 is this thing. Okay. So this one will be 3.6 by 2. You will solve this and its distribution you will compare it with n1 minus 1, so 9 and 11 degrees of freedom. Okay. So this is about this distribution. We know that immediately it will be following this distribution. And when we go to the testing and estimation part, then we will see that basically we compare this value, the one that you obtain over here with the tabulated value and compare the results. Okay, or you can use the p-value method to better see that there is a difference in these two brands of tennis balls or not. So we will look into it in detail later on also. You see that how this distribution over here looks like. It is something from normal population. If you are taking both the samples are coming from the first one and the next one itself, this is also from normal and by the by the by the this is also normally distributed and the size the sample size is the same. Can you see that as you this view curve corresponds to S1 square over S2 square? Okay, so this view is corresponding to the sample size pi and then increase the sample size to 20. And 100, this is how your skewness is decreasing as the sample size is increasing. Okay. This is regarding when you are taking samples from normal populations. There might be situations where you are sampling from non normal populations. Suppose we have taken a sample from uniform distribution. Right? So you can see that here, in this case, again, plot has been squared over S2 squared. Then the initial histograms might be like this, right? So it is skewed. And as you increase the sample size, this it can be plotting this sample distribution of a sample point by sample square, you will see that it will become more and more similar. Right? It will start becoming like this. Different situations will be there, but as the key idea is that when you increase the sample size, then the sample distribution of the ratio of sample variances would approach a normal distribution. Next, we come to the sample distribution of the difference of two proportions. So, last week we studied about single sample problem where we focused on the real single proportion, right? Sample proportion. And we denoted sample proportion by p hat, where p hat came out as x by n, and x we said that is same as binomial distribution, parenthesis n. Right? If you remember this, where x we said that x is the, those individuals, n is the total number of individuals, and x are those individuals who have that characteristic. So basically, it acts as a binomial random variable. 
And if you want to study this, it's equivalent to study this binomial distribution. And we found that it can be approximated by the normal distribution, provided n is greater than equal to 10 and n on minus e is also greater than 10. So this we have seen in the last class. So if we see for this one, there we have difference of the proportion. So let us see what it will result in this case. The results say that suppose you have two samples of sizes n1 and n2, which are coming from normal populations in the proportions e1 and e2 respectively, then e1 had minus e2 normal. Okay? This is approximately normally distributed with this mean and this standard. And this result will go through if each of these are greater than 10. Okay? So here you see, so P1 had to be basically x1 by n1. Okay? Similarly, P2 had to be x2 by n2. And what is this x1? So x1 would be binomial with n1 and P1 with P1 probability. Lx2 would be again binomial n2 e2. Right? So even hat and e2 hat we go over. And we have seen that it is approximately normally distributed. So we are just going to use that same thing over here. Since x1 and x2 both are these, the p1 hat is this. This is approximately normally distributed, so we need the same even and this is the standard. Or you can see this is basically your variance, right? Because expectation of P1 hat, if you find out, this one would be expectation of X1 by N, since X1 is binomial, this would be F2 by P, with basically these two, right? Similarly, if you have to find variance of P1 hat, this one would be P1, because we are doing the plus one, variance of this one would be 1 over N squared. Variance of x1. And we have seen that it will be n two, so and it will cancel out. So you will get p1, 1 minus p2, that is p1 divided by 2. Okay, so this thing we obtained in last time also, and this is the other one. When two are normally distributed, and you take any the combination of them, they are close to long, approximately long distributed. The mean as if you recall from the first one that is mu1 minus mu2, and the other one would be sigma1 square by n1 plus sigma2 square by n2. So now we come to this example. We say that suppose you assume that 5% of the medicines made by drug manufacturing A exhibit a specific side effect, while 4% of that from B display the same side effect. You randomly select 150 samples. This and both companies total is involved in medicine from that we just pick one of the random thing. What's the probability that the proportion of medicines with this side effect from drug manufacturing B exceed that of A? What is DLT? Proportion, let us see. This is the proportion corresponding to first one, and this one is corresponding to the second one. Right? N1 and N2. This is same, right? This is n. Okay. Now we see that this is also satisfying the criteria that n1, p1, and you can say part a, and the other one n2, p2. Okay. So these are same. You can n1 and you can write n2 and n2 also the relation because they are ultimately same also. This is just suffix are used just to make you understand that it is denoting this particular term over here. It depends upon your feasibility and your ease with which you can work. So N1 when you can suppose consider here are more used to that. Let me just try it. So N1 and to P2 and I can say 1 by minus P1 and N2 by minus P2. So this criteria satisfied all are greater than 10. All are greater than 10. So we can say that we can use the normal approximation to this. And for this, we can just simply use the term we have.
this probability we have to find out, we can just take the standard ID. We subtract PA minus PB from here and divide by the standard error. So standard error is this that we have just now found out. This is P1 into 1 minus P1 divided by the N1. So we have P2 into 1 minus P2 divided by this. We can just cross check if it comes out as 0 0.024. And when you substitute the value over here, you get the probability is 0.024. Okay. So this is the probability that the proportion of medicines that this side is from drug manufacturing B exceeds that of B. Okay. So with this we basically complete this concept of sample distribution. In the next lecture we will see how we implement these topics in Python on the so basically what we will do is that we will first see how these distributions that we study for P distribution, chi square, and F distribution, we will visualize in Python, how we write the code for them. And we will, in this case, we will see how these examples basically we can solve using Python. Because we have already seen that even a data set, how we can solve it. But suppose you have this much information, but some information is given to you, then how do you write the code for that in Python? So we will see that in the next lectures and then we will move on to your next